So um, hello, um, uh, good afternoon from Cambridge. Um, I'm Ashley Moffat, um, and uh, to this welcome to the second day of this meeting on maternal mortality in Africa. And we're very lucky today to have um, a very senior midwife from probably the busiest maternity hospital in sub-Saharan Africa, Malago Hospital. And uh, Nora um, Nabakwa has worked there for since 1991. Uh, and she's now uh, a trainer and supervisor of um, midwives. So um, we're very grateful to Nora for um, telling us about uh, her experiences there. And it would be useful to know how we could develop partnerships uh, from Cambridge with um, midwives in Malago as well. Thank you. Hi all, I'm Navaja Oliver Nora Kavma, a nursing officer working in Malago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital. Kampala, Uganda. I'm going to present maternal mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa, the experience of a Ugandan nurse midwife. I'm a nurse midwife. I became a nurse in 1991 and started working in Mulago Specialized Hospital until February 2019. I hold a master's degree in midwifery and women's health. I'm a committee member for Mulago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital Committee for Maternal and Perinatal Death Surveillance and Response. I'm a mentor, a trainer, and a supervisor for nursing students and practicing nurses and midwives. I'm currently working in Mulago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital since February 2019. I manage a postnatal delivery ward in maternal and fetal medicine department. The geographical location of Uganda, on the left, there is a map of Africa, and on the right, the, that is the map of Uganda. So Uganda is an East African country. So it is a low income East African country and its size is about 240,000 square kilometer. Currently the, the population um, estimate is 45.4 million people. And in 2016, we were 41.48 million. So in four years, we've added 3.3 uh, million people. 51% of these people are women, majority of whom are in, unemployed and are housewives. The literacy level for women is 61.97% compared to 79.1 for men. 94% of women do not have medical insurance. And when women have problems like uh, related to pregnancy, they go to government aided health facilities where there is a lot of congestion and the health services are compromised. The selected health indicators for Uganda between 1991 and 2016 are as follows. The contraceptive prevalence rate raised from five and um, when the, the total fertility rate, it was seven in 1991 and in 2016 is 5.4. Unmet need for family planning reduced from 54 and the mortality rate, rate the maternal mortality rate also decreased from 527 to 30, 336 this is all contributed to the policies and the efforts that are put up uh, up by the government of uganda and Many women now can access 
the contraceptive services. That's why the, uh, the total fertility rate has reduced because at least many women can afford to use at least any type of family planning. Adolescent pregnancy has also it, it decreased from 44 to 25 and the, the supervised deliveries also increased from 38 to 74. The women who would attend antenatal and get services from a skilled provider increased from 90, 90 to 97 and those that would deliver from a host facility also increased from 37 to 73 and all those that were attended to by a host skilled provider also increased from 37 to 74. That statistics is from 2001 to 2016. So this is because at least we have health facilities that are manned by both midwives and doctors. And the, as you are seeing in the next slide, we have the organization of maternal health services that are at different levels. The, the lowest level is at the household in the communities and that way there we have health, village health teams who are helping our mothers to teach them about reproductive health services and other issues and when there is a need to provide first aid they can give some drugs and then they send to another level. The second level is health center two and this one carries out outpatient services, for example, antenatal care services, vaccination, and prophylaxis for malaria. Then another level is Health Center 3. This one provides basic preventive, promotive, and curative services. At this center, deliveries are conducted and emergency obstetrical care for example, managing postpartum hemorrhage, uh, managing hypertensive disorder of, of pregnancy can be done here. And when they realize that there is a complication that they cannot manage, they refer to Health Center 4, which is the next level. At Health Center 4, cesarean sections are done, blood transfusion is conducted, and even this is the first level of referral where they have to refer complicated cases to the next level, which is regional referral hospital. So from level one, which is at the household level, to level four, these ones report the district health headquarters. From regional referral hospital, complicated cases are taken to national referral hospital, and in Uganda, we have two national referral hospitals, and the highest is specialized hospital. And in Uganda, we have Mulago Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital, where I work. And these three report the Minister of Health headquarters. The causes of maternal mortality when you compare global with uh, the African countries, the highest is the hemorrhage because most of our mothers die because of bleeding, severe bleeding. And the second is hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So other causes like in the indirect causes include malaria, in Africa and especially, more specifically in Uganda, we have a lot of malaria paired with malaria when they are pregnant. Another one is diabetic mellitus and anemia has caused a lot of maternal mortality in Uganda. Why do Ugandan women die? Ugandan women travel long distances to reach health facilities 
and the transport in is inefficient. Some of them fail to prioritize reproductive health care issues because like the role of a woman in an African culture is to be in the home to provide care to the home people and to produce children. And there are this, there is also inadequate and inaccessibility to quality health services because like I've said, they travel long distances, they stay in remote areas where they cannot get transport to the health facility. So sometimes they just die there uh, because they cannot access the health care facilities. Cultural beliefs and practice is another factor that contribute to mortality of women in Uganda because like I've already said, the role of a woman is to stay in the home, to care for the home people and produce children. So the more children you produce, the more uh, like um, uh, prestige you, you, you become. So uh, increasing fertility is uh, another factor and it is attributed to the cultural briefs and practices. Like I've said, many women, like they have to produce as many as possible so that they can be good to their husbands. And the illiteracy level also hinders access to necessary health care. As you saw in the previous slide, the illiteracy level is also very high. Animate needs for family planning is another factor because although the government has made an effort to communicate, to sensitize these women at all levels, they still think that they have to produce as many children as, as possible. Another one is short birth interval. In the diagrams, you can see how the the, one of the means of transport is overloaded and sometimes in some areas that is the only means of transport. Some people use motorcycles, which one is also hazardous, like you can just imagine a pregnant woman on a motorcycle with bad roads. So in the diagram below you can see this lady was at 40 years and she had already given birth to 44 children. So these children are too many. They cannot even, she cannot afford to take them to the best schools. So she just needs help from the government and to the, some other people who can provide support. So when we think of why women die, we can also think of the three delays model, whereby the first one is delay in making a decision to seek care. Some women have a problem that they cannot recognize that they have danger signs in, uh, in their life, of, uh, like especially when they are pregnant, and uh, they stay in their homes until when they get severe complications that cannot be handled and their lives are not saved. Low confidence in hospital care services. Many of them believe in, um, have high confidence in the, the traditional birth attendants or their friends in the community. One prefers to go to a neighbor to deliver from there because she has some skills and they end up having complications that are related to pregnancy and delivery. Lack of financial support. Like I've said, many of our women are unemployed. They, be, they um, base on their spouses, their husbands, until when they provide financial support, they cannot go to the health facility to seek for medical or obstetric care. Low decision-making capacity is another problem because some women think that they cannot make their own decision and they have to base on their spouses or the husbands. Another delay is delay in reaching the health facility. 
some like when he, on a rainy day when it rains very heavily someone like he cannot access the transport to take her to a health facility and we've lost many women because they cannot reach health facilities because of transport problems sometimes we have floods like you see in the pictures and uh, like even the cars even when you've got some transport with the, a, a motor uh, a motor car you may delay to reach the health facility because of the bad roads and the floods and even uh, the uh, commonest means of transport in our uganda is a motorcycle like you are seeing in the picture so other causes of delay to reach the health facility include fear of being labeled as a coward in the african setting and in uganda when you are pregnant and you go into labor you are not supposed to show your cowardness you have to be very strong otherwise they will label you a coward fear of cesarean section delivery many of our mothers think that when you go to the hospital early when you sense that you are in labor and you just hurry to go to the hospital, they might expose you to cesarean section delivery. Use of local herbs, traditional medicine. We have a lot of this practice in our country. Many of the people just go to the neighbors, to the traditional herbs, um, traditional medicine people, and they seek for, med for advice from there. Which advice is really is not good and they end up like having postpartum hemorrhage having infection from there because their practice is really not medical at all starting with the traditional birth attendance like i've already explained many of our women have a lot of confidence in these people although like at one point in uganda they were trained and we are offering the the services to the women until when it was identified that maybe the, the services were not in line with the objectives of the obstetrical care. And they, although they were trained and supported with some um, equipment, these days they, don't, they are no, no longer considered to be so helpful. And many women are recommended to seek for obstetric care from the health care facilities. Poor referral system, like you've seen our roads and because of the shortage of medical or obstetric health workers. So like sometimes the referral system becomes difficult. You can refer a mother in the morning and then she, it takes her so many hours to reach another facility. Some of them have died on their way to, 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 to going to the health facility and because of the poor roads, the poor weather, and even because of the poverty, even when the transport is available, they may fail to pay for that transport. Failure to recognize danger signs of pregnancy and labor, i explained this in the previous slides training care while at the health facility. If you make a decision from the home and then you access the health care, you've got transport to the health care and you've reached in time, you may fail to get care at the health facility, which is timely. This is because of high volumes of patients, because sometimes you will find a midwife or a doctor like um, presented with the, so many numbers of um, pregnant women and even those in labor. So, so she finds herself overwhelmed and she cannot handle all these numbers like uh, at any given time. Another cause of this delay is patient health care provider ratio. Like I've already said, you find one midwife uh, providing care to over 50 pregnant women. Lack of basic supplies. Sometimes because of the numbers, we find ourselves having limited resources in terms of uh, protective gears, the surgical gloves, the medicines, the blood supply. Sometimes you go to the 
bloody bank and the blood that you need is not available because it has been given to another patient. So failure to screen for high risk cases, the diagnostics are not the best that we have. Sometimes maybe you have diabetes or any other underlying medical condition, but it cannot be identified or diagnosed early in, or in pregnancy, only to find out that you are diabetic during labor when you have a cervical dystocia because of microsomic baby. Failure to prioritize care, triaging at the host facility is also a, a big challenge because like because of the numbers, you may fail to recognize who is very sick and who is who can wait for some time because you are alone as a midwife, as a doctor, you may not know who is very sick so that you provide care according to the severity of the condition. Poor monitoring of labor, or as you all know, midwives, we, are, we have to use partogram to use to monitor labor, but sometimes because of the numbers, even when you have the partograph, you may not uh, monitor the labor closely and then you just in time. So the situation, the situation in, um, in Mlago National Referral Hospital, this hospital, like I said, this is where I started from, but now it was modified to another hospital and later on, like we split and we became different hospitals at different levels. So, but um, still when we were still in Mulago National Referral Hospital, the statistics that he is between June 2019 and January 2020, you realize that the antenatals decreased in number because of the uh, like problems that we had, we had of shifting the services from one area to another. Uh, the vaginal deliveries also, uh, at least for them, they increased because like since it is a national referral hospital, of course we would receive many other complicated cases from the lower health facilities like I've already explained the um the, the the health systems cesarean sections there isn't so much difference between june 2019 and january 2020 so um we started like in the above picture that was the former malago national referral hospital and then we shifted to the that diagram which shows the kawempe national referral hospital but right now we modified to a, a Mulago specialized women and neonatal hospital where I work from currently. The services that are offered in Mulago National Referral Hospital include antenatal care services, labor and delivery services, postnatal services, theater services. This is where we cut out uh, cesarean sections, even those mothers that have severe postpartum hemorrhage, they may decide to do a sterectomy after realizing that the, the, the life of the mother is in danger and the only alternative is to remove the uterus. Family planning services, elimination of mother to child transmission services. This one has really worked out a lot. That's why the HIV prevalence in, 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 in newborns is now getting lower. Diagnostic services, like including ultrasound scans, x-rays, and the laboratory services. Neonatal services, we have uh, a big unit of neonatal care for, for the sick infants. And the, after, like, you realize that when the uh, they are, uh, um, other cases are complicated. So they, these ones are linked to high risk women and you need to um, care to another higher hospital that handles specialized maternal and neonatal care. 
So what has been done to reduce maternal mortality in Mulago National Referral Hospital? So um, the maternal and perinatal death sufferings and response committee has been put in place. And like I've, I've told you, I'm a member of this. We carry out weekly audit meetings. Uh, all maternal and perinatal deaths are expected to be reported and reviewed as per the World Health Organization guideline. Many healthcare providers have been trained in this uh, review and the audit and periodic feedback to stakeholders is given. So when we carry out the, or the maternal audit or the perinatal audit and we identify the gaps, we have to communicate and give a feedback to the referring facilities so that uh, we uh, as uh, an aim of uh, improving the maternal and perinatal care as a way of reducing the maternal mortality and morbidities in Uganda. Infrastructure development, like I've given you the scenarios previously, uh, like we have at the lowest level, we have community health centers from from health center two to health center four. Then we come to the national referral hospitals. And right now we have a newly commissioned specialized women and neonatal hospital, which was commissioned on 2nd of um, October, 2018. And it has nine stories. Uh, it has a bed capacity of 450 beds. It serves as a center for training, research, and medical development. This hospital handles, it's a referral hospital, and it handles all the complicated cases that are referred elsewhere, both government and private health facilities. And it handles mostly women issues as the name stands. Key functions of Ugandan midwives. Midwives carry out a great um, job in Uganda and we have majority of them like leading the most of the lower health facilities from health level two to health care center for these basically are midwifery led and of course we can have some clinical officers who can handle other cases that the midwives cannot handle but majority of these health centers are led by midwives so midwives bridge gaps in health care systems through research and training many of them have gone back to school they conduct research and they've, have, they've reached at the level of um, PhD because most, most of them are pursuing a PhDs and they've really carried out uh, evidence-based labor. Like you can see our mother And um, they also like assess and identify high risk women by carrying out their history taking examinations and um, some even carrying out some investigation, the basic investigations like the blood group, the malaria samples, they can take off blood and take to the lab and uh, so that they can recognize danger signs in uh, yeah, at least a time a timely manner they conduct safe and clean deliveries they promote infection control and prevention provide essential care of uh, postpartum mother and the newborn they also collaborate with other healthcare professionals like doctors the lab assistants and others in the hospital other laws of midwives include health education to the public about reproductive health issues. They go to the communities to tell people about family planning service, services, 
HIV prevention, malaria prevention. They also screen high-risk women of reproductive age. They offer family planning services, advocate for women's health. They, some of them have gone to parliament to talk about reproductive health issues and the fight for women's health. They advocate for partner involvement in reproductive issues. And in many of the health centers, like we involve uh, the men to support the, their women, they accompany them when they have problems to the health centers. We also health educate them about how to identify danger signs so that when they are in their homes, they can help their partners to have at least a quick referral to the health facility to save their lives. They also carry out community-based midwifery care. So uh, this community midwifery care is an individualized care provided in the home environment. Midwives find these women in their homes. It involves provision of safe, evidence-based continuity of care throughout pregnancy, labor, birth, and postpartum period. One of the strategies towards prevention of maternal and neonatal mortalities is community-based midwifery care. So in that picture, that is a midwife who had gone to, she delivered this mother in the hospital and she went back to follow her up for seven days. And as you all know, from 24 to those one week, those are critical days where your mother can have postpartum complications together with her baby. So in the community, women are made the center of the midwifery care. And the midwife assessment is very crucial to rule out complications and carry out timely interventions. So having a good interpersonal skills is a key quality of a good midwife or a nurse. And respect and culture sensitivity are key qualities of a professional midwife. You can see midwives are seated down the chairs are available, but they just have to have a, to be at the same level with the mother so that they win their confidence. They don't show them themselves to be high, higher than the mothers they are providing care to. So that one gains confidence, yeah, like helps the mother to gain confidence in the health workers and they establish a good relationship. So the midwife should be in position to stand the pressures of community midwifery care. When we are conducting with midwifery care, this is not very easy. You can see the way we travel and the, so that you can access this mother. Sometimes it's not very easy to access her, but you try all means to access her because she has to, to, to receive your care however much you like the circumstances may not be like very easy for you as a midwife midwives make a difference in obstetric health care delivery they are um the one who was like uh, with the student and we had um, gone to visit a mother the student had delivered and i went there as a supervisor to see what she was doing so that i could support her And this is part of her training as a student in reproductive health care, like I've already said. So uh, these are uh, these ones they have really to support their women, their health, their wives, and under with modern effort to bring them on board to teach them all the reproductive health issues. And they really have come out to provide support to the women during pregnancy, labor, and even after delivery. So um, even in this picture, you can see a university student nurse providing community midwifery care. He sets a good example to fellow men in the community. And he acts as an advocate for men's involvement in reproductive health care issues. So I carried out a research project 
And this was uh, my research, um, which I did during my course of the master's degree in midwifery and women's health. The title of the research was Maternal and Perinatal Outcomes of Pregnant Women Admitted with Hypertension in Mlago Hospital. And the study site was the former Mlago National Referral and Teaching Hospital, which is now renovated and modified into a specialized women and neonatal hospital. So the study aim and methodology included to describe maternal and perinatal outcomes of pregnant women admitted with the hypertension in order to provide a care that can be uh, provide uh, information or the best plan data that can be used to list strategies toward associated with hypertension. The study design was prospective cohort that employed quantitative methods. And the area of study was generally about where the mothers were delivering from. The study population was pregnant women admitted with hypertension, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And I looked at 110 participants. So the study results, out 86% of the women were between the uh, age of 18 and 35 years. Over 50% started attending antenatal after 20 weeks of gestation. And we, 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 in Uganda, we recommend women that whenever someone recognizes that she's pregnant, she should just begin attending antenatal immediately but as in my study many of them started at 20 or above weeks and they attended at least four times 25 percent high, high had hypertension without preeclampsia 75 had preeclampsia 6.4 percent had preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension and 6.4 percent developed eclampsia so at by variate level, the general maternal outcomes included 78% of the women without preeclampsia, they had normal vaginal delivery. And those with the preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension, 57% uh, of them delivered by cesarean section, 29% developed postpartum hemorrhage, and 57% of them with eclampsia, had major complaints, for example, headache and general body weakness. The general perinatal outcomes are as follows. Neonates of women with preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension had low birth weight. That was uh, the percentage of those were 57%. Those who had low APAGA score was 43%, and those who were preterm were 57%. At mat, mat variate level, 43% of women with preeclampsia had many cesarean sections compared to those without preeclampsia. And 19% had major complaints compared with those who did not have um, preeclampsia. So there was no statistically significant difference between the outcomes of women with and without preeclampsia or eclampsia. So I concluded that adverse pregnancy outcomes were common in women with preeclampsia, superimposed on chronic hypertension or eclampsia. Hypertension negatively impacts on pregnancy outcomes and its disorder should therefore be timely detected, diagnosed and effectively managed. Because when you don't um, recognize that the woman has hypertension, she can end up having seizures and even some complications like postpartum hemorrhage and even some of them have died because of their hypertension. 
So uh, implementation of management protocols must be examined to identify the gaps in the practice. That was my recommendation because we have these protocols at all levels, in labor ward, in postnatal, post even in maternal fetal medicine, where mothers are admitted when they are, where they, when they are still pregnant. But I was just wondering whether these protocols are being implemented because if they were implemented, we would be having less mothers who have complications with um, hypertension because when they come to us, we, we should know what to do immediately to help them survive and their babies survive and eventually meet on the complication that may occur because of hypertension. So positive outcomes of pregnancy bring joy to the mother, the newborn, and the host care providers. Like you are seeing in the pictures, the midwife is having twins and she's very happy. The mothers, both of them are looking at their babies and they feel joy of being pregnant and then they come up with the live, with live babies and even you stay alive as a mother. Because like we are saying, Many of uh, our mothers have not come out of the pregnancy-related uh, complications, and they've died because of during labor, during delivery, even during antenatal. So that was my presentation. Thank you for listening and your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nora, for covering what happens in Uganda as a whole and your own experiences um, in Malaga, including your research. And we have got quite a few questions. If anybody wants to add any more, please do. But I'm just going to ask the first question as the chairman, which is, um, I think many of us will be interested to hear about the experiences in this COVID-19 pandemic and how that has affected uh, delivery of uh, maternal uh, care. Um, to the women. I, I'm sure that it's even more difficult to get to hospital, for example. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, thank you. Um, when the COVID had just started, we, we were all failing because we didn't know what to do. As midwives, you know, we have to deliver these women when we are close to them. And uh, what happened is uh, at first we are just not providing the quality care, but afterwards they went, they, we went through training. They trained all of us at our facility how to care for these mothers. And they also gave us um, protective gears like masks, um, aprons, um, uh, eye goggles. So uh, eventually we learned how to manage them, but it's still a challenge because when you come close to the mother, you may contract the infection. And indeed, some of our midwives have ended up having the COVID-19 and they were admitted to hospital. But what happened after, mothers were screened on admission. But as you know, sometimes though, of course, the, 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 the results don't, don't come right away. So sometimes you find yourself handling a mother who is infected and you, you cannot know whether that mother is infected until uh, at a certain time we would, when you've already uh, offered the care. So uh, in summary, we are trying our best, but we still fear because we have to have close contact with the mother when you are delivering her, especially when you are providing the delivery services. Good, thank you. So um, I, we have some questions now, and I'm just going to um, pick a few. So uh, Anonymous, can you explain what a partogram is and what it is used for? So I think many of the audience are actually uh, and not, not uh, uh, midwives or doctors, so perhaps you could explain that um, for them, uh, Nora. A partogram is a tool that we use to monitor labor and it has uh, four sections. It has, man you monitor maternal condition. You also monitor the progress of labor. 
you also monitor the well-being of the uh, of the new, uh, newborn. I mean the the inborn, um, unborn child. So with the mother, that partogram you have to indicate when the mother is admitted, and we begin with the, the partogram when the mother is in established active labor. That is when the dilatation, cervical dilatation is at four centimeters dilated. So we begin a partogram and we note the time when we've begun, when the time the, the membranes are ruptured. We also indicate the vital signs like the blood pressure, the pulse of that mother, and you also indicate the well-being of the fetus, especially the fetal heart, which we do every 30 minutes. We also note the molding, and we also note the uterine contractions. We note the descent of the presenting part. We also note like we take off uh, urine and we check for um, prote proteins and um, acetone and even sugars. So this partogram has uh, an, a, an alert line and action line. So as midwives, we have to make sure that a normal labor progresses on the alert line. When it crosses over to go to the action line, we have to make a quick and timely decision to either refer or to follow a doctor because as a midwife, you may not be able to handle the abnormal, abnormal labor. When you realize that the labor is obstructed or prolonged as, as by way of looking at the partogram, you make a quick decision because you want to save both the life of the mother and the life of the new, of the, new the baby or the unborn child. Good, good. And is it is it um, used in all patients? Do all patients have a partogram? It is not used to. It is supposed to be used on all mothers, but because of the volumes, we you may find that the one midwives is handling like twenty mothers. But of course, when you have like five of them in in labor, and you realize that they will not go into second stage at once, you can prioritize and choose to use that partogram on the mother who is likely to have a problem. But that partogram is supposed to be used on all mothers who are in active stage of labor. Okay, thank you. So um, from uh, Shane now we have, is it possible to say what proportion of deliveries occur at referral units are actually referred patients? So how many of the patients have you you have at your referral hospital have been referred to you or how many have just turned up like uh, um, the, our our hospital is um, a, a, a national referral so we we can get about 20 20 to 25 referrals in a day those that are those mothers have been managed in the lower facilities which we call health centers, and those are midwifery led. There are no doctors there. So when those uh, midwives realize that these mothers have complications or the baby has a complications, they refer these mother mothers uh, to, the, to, to our facility, which is a national referral. Other referrals come from private hospitals because ours is government aided. So others come from private health facilities. Uh, good. So from Yulia, we have a um, question. Can you please also say more about how you deliver and provide antenatal care? Do you follow the four-tier structure you described and who provides the antenatal care? So um, the antenatal care is provided by the midwives. But when the midwife realizes that there is a complication with the mother, she refers to the facility where they are doctors. But in these lower facilities, we have health center two, health center three. So that one, those ones midwives refer to those other higher facilities. And when mothers come in antenatal, we, 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 we provide care depending on the gestational age. So we go by, we still go by the four visits, 
but uh, the World Health Organization has uh, increased it from four to eight. So uh, some centers have adopted it to providing um, antinodovis, eight of them, but majority of them are still providing four visits. At each visit, we, we have, um, we go by what is supposed to be uh, provided per each visit. So basically, uh, midwives do a lot of antenatal care, especially those with the normal pregnancy. When they identify that there are the complications, they refer those mothers to a higher facilities where they are doctors. Good. So I'm just picking a few of these questions. We've got a lot of questions here. So um, from Anonymous, um, how easy is uh, the diagnosis of proteinuria? So this is clearly in relation to picking up preeclampsia. Um, are dipsticks available in the community? Have you found the cradle device for BP measurement widely used? So that's an, you maybe you could explain what the cradle device is, Nora. Yes, uh, all health facilities, even those with the, low, the lower facilities have uh, dipsticks. They are really able to diagnose preeclampsia as early as possible because midwives are taught and trained to check urine on all mothers who come in, when they are pregnant. So the, 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 the heuristics are there and these uh, midwives are able to diagnose preeclampsia. Then um, the cradle, yes, in our facility, this national referral, we have cradle because there is uh, our head of department, the head of obstetric, and the gynecologist department, Professor Nachimuli Anit, she, she brought these cradles. She took us through on how to use them, and they've really done great work because we've really used them without problems, and we've managed to take blood pressures of all mothers that come in antenatal, even during labor. Good. Yes, I remember when I was doing my study there, we had great difficulty in finding enough blood, old-fashioned blood pressure machines. To, to, so they, they, must yes. be, they must be a huge uh, uh, advance, yeah. So um, another question from Yulia. Um, are any telehealth or mobile services used on a community level to help support maternal health? So I uh, may not call them mobile. So like at each facility, we have what we call um, community outreach and it is programmed, it is on the program of the lower health facilities like health center two, health center three, where midwives leave their health centers to go to um, the community and uh, train mothers. And even in the community, we have village health teams these are people who are not medically trained, but they are lay people, they identified them, they taught them to give the basic treatment, like giving antimalarial treatment, like um, recognizing mothers with the problems and they refer as, uh, they, uh, uh, as soon as possible. And we also have um, uh, private uh, associations or organizations that have come up with um, with uh, some uh, measures of like uh, going to teach the midwives in the in the lower health facilities to go to the community to recognize mothers with the problems and even those village health teams to refer them as soon as they recognize that they have problems. They put um, because now the challenge of our mothers in the community is transport to the health facility but at least they've identified them and put some motorcycles that can um, help them deliver them to, to the coast facilities. Those who cannot go like on a motorcycle, they call for ambulance and the ambulance can take them to the coast facility. Thank you. So, um... From Simon uh, Stretzer, so what happened, uh, looking at the, some of the data you showed us, Nora, what happened in 2002? Because the TFR, the maternal mortality rate, and supervised deliveries all seem to improve significantly. What happened then? 
So um, since that, during that time, we had um, um, uh, some facilities were closed because of uh, renovations. And um, I remember that time, many of them would not even come to um, the, the facilities to receive care. So I think that's why some of those um, figures went up. But uh, uh, I also wondered, because uh, I, I don't remember exactly why, but what I remember is that this, the, the mothers could not access the health facility because they were under renovation and they were diverted to go to other facilities and the majority of them could not even have accessibility to those um, uh, health facilities. Good, so um, uh, I, I'm just picking these a little bit randomly, but so for one from Corinna Allberg, um, is blood pressure routinely measured at health levels two and three so that there is timely um, uh, a diagnosis of um, preeclampsia? How often do women have their blood pressure and their urine measured? Whenever a woman uh, visits a host facility, the first thing the midwife does after doing a quick assessment, a quick uh, hospital taking, is to take her blood pressure. And uh, the, there is support supervision that is carried out uh, with uh, ident people who were identified right from the Minister of Health and uh, so they go to like to, 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 to do support supervision and one of the things that they look for uh, that is uh, in the health facility is a blood pressure machine and when the facility does not have a pressure machine they make an effort to provide one because that's the only way we can diagnose preeclampsia timely and we refer this mother to a host facility that can manage the eclampsia or eclampsia. Good, so from Laura Richardson, there's a question. Uh, what, if any, kind of literature that uh, can give advice to uh, pregnant women is given out? And also, she has two questions actually. Also, is there any home visit or labor system at home or does everybody deliver in hospital? Or if it's no, it is not. Yeah, it's not by all. Uh, maybe what I've not um, talked. I'm sorry, there is a phone that is ringing. <laughs> <laughs> that is the sound that you can hear. Sorry, I'm in a certain hotel. I requested because the, the network is, is clear there. So bear with me with that uh, sound. So, um, um, So you're going to tell us about the literature that's given out, the, the advice that's given out. The advice. Yes. So um, we don't give um, written uh, information. So many, many times when the mothers come, we, 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 we go through health education, like about nutrition, uh, how they can prevent malaria because malaria is very uh, disturbing infection in our environment and uh, how to use the mosquito net because mosquito nets are given out uh, mm -hmm. in the antenatal clinics. So we also talk about uh, danger signs like bleeding during pregnancy, the blurring of vision, the frontal headache. So we take them through and so that when they, they identify those um, uh, danger signs early, they can report to the health facility. We so also... I, yeah, sorry, we heard yesterday that from Shane that um, the language uh, is very important, that, uh, that sometimes it, it, if the advice is only given in English, it isn't, uh, it isn't understood very well. What language do you give the advice in... in uh, Yes, indeed. Indeed, we have a problem in our country because we have over 60, 56 languages. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, the good thing is that each local, each host facility, the people around there, at least they know the language that is being talked. They, so the vernacular, they, so that they use 
many midwives who are in that area use that local language that is used in that, that um, the health facility. So, but when you, you have problem with the language barrier, we will make an effort to call for someone to, to interpret what you are saying. But the challenge is like sometimes when you talk, there is change of information by the interpreter. So sometimes there is a challenge there, but we try by all means by using the language that is very clear. Majority of our mothers do not understand English. So we use local languages to communicate to them. So I think we've just got time for one more question. So I guess and maybe sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what I wanted to say, even during the training, uh, our our midwives when they are undergoing treatment, there is what we call community midwifery care. So we, we that is part of their training. So they follow up some of these mothers as a way of learning how to provide postnatal care. But at the at the same time, our mothers benefit a lot from that community midwifery care that is done at diploma level and university levels. So just one last question, uh, Nora. Um, with midwives playing such a crucial role, um, how adequate is the provision per head of population across all districts of Uganda? I mean, are there some that are poorly provided compared with um, you in Kampala? Yes, that one is still a challenge because our midwives do not want to go in hard rich areas. They want to stay in Kampala. So sometimes you go to a host facility up country, like in the northern region, and you only find one midwife uh, doing everything. So the, she's overworked and she's overwhelmed by the numbers of mothers. And you, and you find that that one compromises on the quality of the care that she has to deliver to these mothers. But of course, the ministry is working hard to um, deploy more midwives. But uh, like I said, many midwives do not want to work in those areas, it's except those who are born there, or like when you give them a pay that is more than what you pay those in Kampala. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we've got um, to stop now, Nora, but I, can I thank you again for contributing to this and, and giving up your time uh, to, to tell us yes. your experiences. It's, we're very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you.